All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome again to virtual seminars for pre Cambrian geology. Uh, today we have a talk by uh, Professor Cynthia Lee from Rice University titled Grants as Symptoms, Not Causes of Continental Crust. Next week, we'll hear from Lyle Nelson at Johns Hopkins University on calibrating the Ediacaran Cambrian transition updates from the Kalahari and Southwest Shore of Laurentia. Um, Today, I do have an extra announcement. We're going to start in an effort to try and be more organized in our discussion sessions. Um, we're going to change up, change that up a bit. We're, gonna, we're going to try and focus on questions that are more applicable to the broader audience first. So we'll start with a more simple uh, Q&A. And those of you who have questions that are more specific to the topic that you think might not be uh, applicable to the broad audience, and you're the best judge of that yourself. Um, please, please try to hold them a bit at the end of the Q&A. We'll transition to our more uh, typical open discussion. Um, and I'll cut the video before the open discussion because I need to keep these shorter than they have been um, for ease of upload to YouTube. Um, and then we'll sort of let everybody who feels close to the topic and wants to discuss more deeply to sort of have a more open, less moderated discussion. Um, and that'll be limited only by the amount of time the speaker has and how long the discussion will go. So I'm gonna put that sort of, that I'm gonna put that on our website uh, for reference for everybody. Um, and, and that's all I have to say. So we're, we're excited to have Sintili here with us and Andre's gonna introduce him for us. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Sinti Lee. Uh, he has a, a family connection to uh, UCR. Uh, his father worked, he is a geophysics professor. And Sinti Lee got interested in geology when before he entered university, uh, working with uh, Doug Martin, uh, who was associated with our department. And he continued with a PhD from Harvard University, working with Roberto Rudnik, and when a postdoc at Caltech, working with Jerry Wasserberg. And, uh, and now he's a professor at Rice University, and his main interest on interaction of magma with crust and impact on formation of continental crust on biosphere and a composition of the atmosphere and ocean. And with this, I pass it to Cynthia Lee. Okay, thank, okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, great, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Andre and Alex, uh, for the introduction and inviting me. Uh, really looks like a interest, very interesting um, seminar series. So again, thanks for uh, having me participate. Um, I'll just start off by saying, as as I've gotten older, I I guess I feel like I know less, and and I'm not really sure of anything anymore, um, and so maybe that'll come out from this this talk. Uh, so I, I may not uh, conclude with something really um, hard, but the title here, uh, "Granites uh, Symptoms Not Cause of the Continental Crust," is kind of meant to be a, a little bit provocative. I guess, uh, you know, in the background right here, is, it's a tonalite, but I'm gonna use granite as a much more uh, loose term uh, because most people are familiar with, with granite. Um, this is actually from Southern California here. And uh, granites are, are these felsic rocks and uh, uh, often thought to be something unique to our planet, uh, Earth. And I guess um, what I want to end up with is the, uh, notion that maybe granites can occur on other planets or even continents can con occur on planets, but uh, the connection between granites and continental crust is not as straightforward as we uh, uh, have like often thought. And so I'm gonna start with, um, uh, let's see, why doesn't this advance? Okay, this really um, nice paper by Campbell and Taylor 1983, and it, it was very influential for me. And so that's why I want to quote from it. 
And it says water is essential for the formation of granite and, and granite in turn is essential for the formation of the continents. These are profound statements. And then it goes on further. Well, all the other rocky planets have no water and therefore no granites and no continents. And so uh, the framework here, or this is the paradigm, water is necessary to make granites and granites are necessary to make continents. So what, what exactly does this all mean? And uh, that's what I'm going to uh, come at. Um, and if you go with that, this is also quoted uh, from their uh, very uh, seminal paper, is that the formation of continents requires the production of these uh, vast amounts of granite, and that requires the transport of large amounts of water into the upper mantle. And so if that's the case, then uh, a simple way of doing this is subduction of hydrated oceanic crust back into the into the mantle. And, and this, is, this is our modern framework, or at least since the Proterozoic, we, we understand this. Uh, we have uh, oceanic lithosphere and there's an ocean and it interacts and you get hydrated ocean crust, goes down, prograde metamorphic reactions, uh, uh, release that water and that water goes up to give you uh, uh, depressed solids, makes melts, hydrous melts. And then when they get to the top, they've, you know, they have gone through this whole period of uh, crystal fractionation, and then what comes out up here are granitic rocks or felsic rocks. And the key is plate tectonics for that. And so um, in that framework, no water, no granites, um, uh, no continents. It also means no plate tectonics. So, um, and, I, and I, this talk wants to revisit that because I, I want to uh, ask whether by thinking it solely in that way, where we restrict ourselves to understanding, you know, whether continents are possible on other planets or even in Earth's early history. So just um, because I know the audience is very broad, uh, some really basic slides here, maybe overly simplistic, but what is a granite? Here's this granite countertop in the background here. Well, they are these uh, silicic magmas. This is, these are volcanic equivalents, but rhyolites, 70% silica, and um, they come ultimately from basalts, either by fractional crystallization, large amounts of crystallization, or small degree remelting of basalts. But you start here with a basaltic uh, magma, and then with cooling, you get to a rhyolite. And this is just taken from Wikipedia, Bowen's reaction series, which we teach in intro classes. Um, this is going down in temperature, hot to cold, and the early forming minerals are low in silica. And if you crystallize those, the residual liquid eventually becomes more quartz rich and you get granites. Okay, so that's what a granite is. It's the last dregs uh, and the cold dregs of magmatic uh, differentiation. So we're talking like uh, 700, 800 degrees as opposed to 1200 degrees for the parent, the parent magma. And of course, why, why would geologists or petrologists be interested in the formation of granites? Well, this goes back to uh, a lot of the, how I started working with Roberta Rudnick as, when I was a grad student. And it's that uh, if you look at the models for continental crust, um, this, this is silica, the uh, x-axis, uh, the continental crust on average is felsic, 60, 65% silica, and there's granites in there too. But, uh, um, but the juvenile magmas that come from the mantle are mafic or basaltic, so 50% silica. So somehow, we have to take that basalt and move it this way. And it's those processes that of course interests uh, petrologists. And you can see here that juvenile island arcs tend to be more basaltic. And then when you get to these mature continental arcs, they actually become a little bit more felsic. And, um, and of course, to do that, you have to leave behind some mafic uh, residue or accumulates. And, and that was uh, a lot of the ideas motivated ideas for recycling this stuff back into the mantle by delamination or some sort of foundering. Um, and we're not going to talk about that so much here. We want to, I'm just interested in how do you get from here to here, the processes. And that's why petrologists are interested because it continental crust is felsic. And if you can understand why you make felsic crust, then you, you might understand how continents are formed. Um, so let me go to other simple uh, concepts here. What, what is a continent or definition, I should say? And, it kind of depends on who you talk to. Um, if I talk to the um, 
a non-geologist probably they say, oh, continents, that's easy. It's just the stuff that lies above sea level. And that's almost uh, right, but not perfectly right because we know our continents have been inundated. In the Paleozoic, all of Western North America was below sea level, right? And we also have continental shelves, uh, which are below sea level, but we consider them continents like here in the Bering Sea, last glacial maximum, that was exposed. So it's not really about whether you're above land. Um, and then if you talk to uh, petrologists, including myself, we often will say, well, continents are the stuff that's underlined by uh, felsic rocks. But I could say, well, what about Ontang Java, uh, which is below sea level, uh, but if sea level were to drop significantly, uh, probably not, couldn't do that much today, but if it did, that would be exposed and you might call that a continent as well. So it's not necessarily composition. Uh, the real the definition of what the continent is, is that the hypsometry of our planet is of course bimodal and the low elevation made the, what we call ocean basins, but the continents uh, form this, this, this uh, higher elevation or they're riding high, mostly at sea level with the active areas of continent formation being uh, really high, four kilometers, but we have a considerable amount that's actually below sea level. And those are the continental shelves. And that amount, of course, fluctuates depending on dynamic topography, uh, glacial interglacials and so forth. So it's really this. And so you kind of have to ignore uh, the water and just think about, well, why do we have these regions that ride high above the ocean basins? The reference should be the ocean basins. So that's what continents are, but what is continental crust? And um, continental crust is important to get this uh, clear from the beginning because I will come back to this uh, uh, crust a lot, is, is defined here as um, the MOHO, the seismic discontinuity and velocities. And in general, this is thought to be a, a change in composition from something more felsic to something ultramafic. Uh, and that could be from here to what I didn't draw here, but the mantle, uh, uh, or, it could be the felsic or the mafic or crust uh, transition to, to the mantle. And that is, uh, constitutes the base of uh, the continental uh, crust. So let me go back to the first uh, statement um, uh, of our paradigm is that water is essential for the formation of granite. And what does that actually mean? And um, so granite is the, the form, these fossil was formed after extreme uh, fractional crystallization, you cool the, the, the magma, uh, basaltic magma considerably, and then you reach the realm of these felsic uh, rocks. But of course, what water does is it depresses the solidus and allows you to do this at lower temperatures. So you could remelt a basalt, instead of at 1200, you do it at 700 degrees. Or if you fractionate a basalt, you could let it go down to lower temperatures where it can incubate there. And so you just don't need as much thermal energy if you have water to generate granites. So in that sense, it's not necessarily essential, but it, it certainly helps in making uh, it easier to form granites. And the other thing is that if you add water to the system, so this is melting degree and or melt productivity, and this is temperature here. And if you add water, so you'll have these different curves, so you, you make the melting point lower, but you change the shape of the melt productivity such that the, the range in which you get these low temperature magmas uh, or the volumes that you produce actually is expanded. And these happen to be more uh, solicitic. So it actually expands the field for solicitic magmas. So water is not essential to make granites, but it makes it easier to make granites. So it's a subtle difference. And it also makes it easier to make lots of granite, okay? So if you don't have water, you could still get some granites. You probably won't get a lot. The second part of that sentence was uh, granite in turn is essential for the making of continents. And this, this is um, an important statement because it, it implies something about the physics. And what I'm showing you here is a free air gravity map. Um, and what it is, is if you fly your airplane at the same elevation over uh, the earth, uh, and you measure how the gravity below you, or what it's actually measuring is the amount of mass uh, below you, and you would think that under the highest elevations, you'd have more mass because you just got thicker, uh, I mean, the, the topography. But it turns out there is no mass uh, excess you can look at. So if you ignore the edges of the you know, subduction zones, you, you can look at um, uh, 
uh, Indian Ocean Basin. You can look at Africa, which is high. You can't tell the difference in terms of gravity. In fact, you can look at the center of Tibet, four kilometers high, and uh, look at the Indian Ocean Basin. There's no difference. Again, at the margins, uh, there's, there's some edge effects and some uh, flexure issues here. But, but away from those, you can't tell the difference. And what that tells you is that the Earth is fluid on geologic timescales, and it's equalizing the gravitational potential. The rocks can flow to do that, so you're in isostatic equilibrium. And so there is no mass excess. And the only way you can explain that is by, of course, isostasy. But there are two ways. One is that uh, the continental crust, they're high because they're really thick. So buoyancy is a combination of density and size. So they have a very deep root. Or that the continents are high because they're underlain by granite, which is lower density than basalt. And you wouldn't necessarily need a root. Now, the real reality might be somewhere in between here, but these are the two extremes. And with gravity, you can't actually tell the difference here. So, the, you know, the question is, are continents buoyant because they're underlain by low density granite? And, and that's the paradigm. If, if uh, you think granites are responsible for making continents, this, the implicit assumption there is that the granites are lower density, they don't get subducted, they allow to build the continents up so they're uh, so they, they float up. Um, but here's a figure that should show that that is probably not the case. And this is something we've actually always known. This is elevation versus crustal thickness. And this crustal thickness is the depth to the moho. So it's taken from the uh, crust 1.0 model of, of, of Mooney and his colleagues. And you can see what I've only plotted just to keep it simple, are the high elevations of mountains, Tibet, Andes, Rocky Mountains. And then you also have the oceanic crust. And of course, the oceanic crust is only seven to 10 kilometers thick and it's riding low uh, in the ocean basins. And then the mountains ride high. And even though oceanic crust is basaltic and these are felsic, they have this uh, strong, um, a, uh, 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 this correlation here that elevation links up with uh, crustal uh, thickness. And I've also put on you know, densities or effective density contrast between the crust and the mantle. You can see here's 2.0 or 2.9. Yeah, variation in density are important, but uh, uh, crustal thickness plays a much larger role uh, here. And so really it's uh, the high elevations have a root, continents right high because they have this, this root here. And the density contrast between granites and basalts is really not sufficient to give you um, that whole range in elevation. So the density difference is, is a secondary effect. The most important is crustal thickness, not composition. So here is the paradigm. But now what I guess I want to open up or challenge or is maybe a different or real restructuring of this paradigm where actually the most important thing is crustal thickening. However you do it in plate tectonic mode, that's easy. In a non-plate tectonic mode, that's what we should be talking about. And so when you make the crust thick, that's what makes the continents. It doesn't need granites, it doesn't need water. But when you add water to it, you can form granites and if you make it thick, you can also form granites. And the combination of this is what makes the granite. So granite is no longer a requirement, but rather a response or a symptom of the processes that make continents. And that is crustal thickening. And, and why I, and I may be wrong on this, but why I want to reframe the, the picture here is that if we were to go to Mars or Venus, um, this is Mars topography at the top and you see um, you, know, you might not call this ocean and, and continent, but if you fill this with water, I'd call it ocean and continent, but it's lowlands and highlands uh, here, this hemispheric dichotomy. And here's the free air gravity anomaly map and they ignore the, the little red ones, which are young volcanoes. But you can see, you can't tell the difference between the lowlands and the highlands. It's in isostatic equilibrium, Mars. And is it because this is underlain by granite or is it because the crust is just thicker? Um, and granted, again, I'm using it very loosely here. Uh, and, and if it's thicker, you might ask, well, maybe there are some granites, but is it, so we, we don't know. Um, we don't think there are granites there, but 
uh, I would say we, we actually don't know. We don't have enough data. In fact, we don't even know the parcel thickness that well based on the latest paper on, uh, from Insight. And so thinking or reframing it should help us kind of open up our minds to other possibilities, possibilities that you know, even I haven't thought about. So that's um, so. What I'm going to do is come back to what we understand today, or our current picture of how the crust forms. That's the Phanerozoic or Proterozoic to, to the present. This sort of paradigm. Let's let's talk about how you get um, uh, granitic or felsic rocks here, and then we'll end with uh, uh, the Archean. Um, so back to this restructuring of this framework. Uh, I put another plot up, and this is the silica content of lavas uh, when they erupt as uh, in arcs all around the world. So they're modern as a function of elevation. And it's sort of weird. This is from Michael Farner. Uh, the composition of lavas correlates with elevation. That's kind of crazy. Some geochemical thing corresponding to uh, uh, some geophysical thing that doesn't, you know, doesn't, isn't obvious that it should make any sense. But remember, the Earth is in isostatic equilibrium. And the reason why we did this is we actually used elevation to tell us what the crustal thickness was. We didn't have enough uh, representation from the seismics to, to get to, to map out every single place where we had volcanoes. We used elevation. So if you think about it that way, it makes more sense that the thicker the crust, um, the longer this uh, distillation column is that magmas have to go through and they end, end up losing their heat and then they uh, when they finally get out, you should see more silicic magmas. So nothing, nothing crazy about that. Qualitatively, it makes complete sense. Shouldn't be surprising uh, at all, although it's very nice to actually show that there is this uh, amazing uh, representation. Um, but what we can do is, um, and so this, this is, uh, and you can do this for any arc, but uh, you can think of this long distillation column of magmas coming up from the mantle wedge, they're hydrous and they go up, cold thermal boundary layer, and they cool off and they drop their loads all the way from the bottom before they get to the top. And these are all the cumulates and a whole series of cumulates. And of course you get the felsic plutons at the surface and the stuff that, that erupts. So that we sort of understand at least on the qualitative scale. But it still goes back to this question that, that I have, and it's something that has bothered me. And I don't know if it bothers others. Uh, maybe I'm going down a, 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 a unusual path here, but I've always wondered is not only, you know, the first is these, these felsic rocks, remember they are the last differentiates. They are cold, colder magmas, and there shouldn't be a lot of it around. Um, and we had always talked about it in the terms of the mass balance problem that you need massive amounts of mafic cumulates to compensate for that. And so from a mass balance perspective, that was always a problem and we can deal with it by you know, doing delamination or, or whatever. But from a the physical point of view, the process sees there, we still have to understand, yeah, how do you actually physically get uh, so much of these cold magmas, which should otherwise be in low volume, and not only that, they come up as big plutonic bodies. How do you get these big bodies here? And you can go to the Sierra Nevada, they're, they're bath, the big bath there, and there's plutons of pretty large scale, kilometers in scale. This is half dome, it's cut in half here, but it uh, was much bigger. Uh, but, and they're actually quite homogeneous, actually. So how do you get so much of this? And water, of course, is going to help us, but is water by itself sufficient to, to do this? Um, so recently, and, and this is actually um, in, inspired by a lot of the work that uh, Doug Morton um, uh, did at, at the UC Riverside actually. And he, he mapped out all the plutons and, and we basically looked at the compositions of the plutons and, um, uh, mapped out their, their sizes here. And then we plotted the pluton area versus the silica content. And obviously we don't have the vertical uh, dimension. We also don't have, uh, the, we have to worry about the issues of preservation or erosion. But if you look at the scale here, 600 kilometers squared to uh, less, you know, 50 kilometers squared, even less, you know, those uncertainties 
uh, or in the noise. Okay, These, this is a huge variation. What you see here is that uh, there's a big spread, but the upper envelope here is telling you that it again, well, confirming that that suspicion that I had these felsic intermediate magmas, which really should not, there shouldn't be a lot of them. They actually form also the biggest um, magmatic bodies, the biggest uh, plutons. And then the really silicic ones, of course, you don't get a lot of those, but these intermediate ones, you get some big, big guys. And if you look at this variable, gadolin euterbium versus silica, then geochemists use this just to, as an indirect uh, measure the, of uh, pressure of differentiation, either amphibole or what I think is garnet uh, fractionation or deep in the crust, is tell you that there's some connection with these, making these big magmatic bodies, uh, although they're at the surface now, they're formed deep in the crust. And if it's deep in the crust, it means that the crust was quite thick that, uh, when it was forming at the time. That, that whole distillation column that the magmas passed through, much of their own doing, is, is very thick. So Andean style sort of uh, continental arc scenario. And so I, we, we did some simple analysis here to ask how do you make thick um, uh, a thick partially molten zone so you can get enough of these magmas to eventually rise up. And so here, subduction zone and uh, uh, a thin crust like an island arc, continental crust, like the Andes or the ancient Sierra Nevada. And then this right here is if you were to look down the slab, and then this direction is a long arc. And I'm just showing you different scenarios here. And really what we're trying to do is understand the thermal state of the, the lower part of the, the active arc. And that's uh, this depth here, and this is temperature, and this is the uh, 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 geotherm here. And what controls that temperature is a uh, combination of things. You have melting from the mantle wedge that advects heat into the crust. You have heat flow from the mantle wedge in here. And then you have heat loss uh, from down here through the surface. And all of those, um, the addition of heat and the loss of heat interplay to eventually give you the characteristic temperature at the bottom. And the question then is, does it cross the wet or the dry solids? And if it does, then uh, we define that as the, the, the zone of partial melting. And this is the birthplace of all of these felsic magmas um, that come up, or the staging zone for these felsic magmas to come up. And, and one other thing in this that is subtle but incredibly important is this magmatic flux from the mantle wedge actually is inversely related to the thickness of the uh, overlying crust and lithosphere. That is, if it gets too thick, then you you pinch out the mantle wedge and there's no, no decompression. You also may cool the subducting slab. And so you don't get a lot of the melts. So the thin uh, crust will have high magmatic flux, thick crust uh, won't. And so you have all these uh, factors uh, working at the same time. And so the end product is not entirely intuitive until you try to uh, put these, uh, lay out all these, these uh, controls. And so, um, for the, those who are more inclined to the modeling, this is a partially molten zone, and all these arrows correspond to basically it's a box model of energy or heat. And you can uh, come up with an equation of what is the steady state temperature of this partially molten zone uh, as a function of all these quantities, and it looks complicated. But all you have to really think about, if you really simplify it, is to this number, which I call the recharge number, which is the, the thickness of the crust and multiply it by the magmatic flux, and then, of course, thermal diffusivity. But these Z and J are the ones that are, are going to vary in time or in different types of arc environments. So the bigger or the thicker the crust, um, the more uh, inefficient uh, heat will be lost, and so you'll have a hotter molten zone and a bigger molten zone. The more recharge you have, it'll be hotter down there, uh, and the less you have, it'll be colder. And then the question then is what controls Z and J? That's really all that it's about. And so this is the, re the result and um, it, it looks complicated, but hopefully I can try to explain it here. This is crustal thickness on the X axis. This is the temperature in the lower crust uh, in these uh, arcs and magmatic zones. And here you can see that effect when the crust is really thin, like in a 
uh, Middle Ocean Ridge or an island arc, it's, it can't be that hot in this, and this gray zone is the point where uh, you get um, minimum melting, so you get granites. So if the crust is too thin, you just can't uh, uh, generate a lot of these, these granites, there'll be a small amount. And um, by the same token, when the crust is too thick, uh, and the reason why you can't do it there is because you lose heat too fast. When the crust is too thick, you also can't generate that much melt because um, uh, the, there's not enough magmatic recharge from the mantle wedge. And so there's a sweet spot, which of course there is highly dependent on various parameters. That's why there's these different curves, but the, you just need to know that there is a sweet spot where you have, once the crust gets to a certain thickness, then it becomes quite hot. And we can then uh, put a, um, a phase diagram to that and try to estimate how much melt you get. That's what this is. We can also calculate how thick the zone of melting is. And that's what this one here is. And that's telling you that uh, it's also showing you the sweet spot. This is showing you a sweet spot too. The sweet spots uh, are not exactly the same for the melting degree or the uh, crustal thickness. When you, you, but you have to combine the two, F times H, and that's what gives the total available melt that can go up to form a pluton. So um, it, down here with thin crust, you, you might be able to generate uh, some granitic magmas down there, but there's just not enough of it to give you any big batholith at all. And of course, uh, uh, when the crustal thickness gets really large, you have plenty of it to, to give uh, rise to a batholith. But if it gets too thick, you kill, you kill it off. And in some sense, uh, in retrospect, I guess that's all obvious, but at least uh, we can put some numbers and to it and, and uh, we can tease out what are the uh, driving physical uh, factors that, that control this. Now, this one, I combine all of those. And what I'm doing is looking at the total available melt versus the temperature of the magmas uh, down there that can be expelled up to form these plutons. And so you wanna go along one of these loops uh, there's this hysteresis here. And so the, uh, you take this one right here and there are four different magmatic fluxes, but uh, let's just look at this big one right here. Uh, and what will happen is, um, and they're contrary to crustal thickness. When the crust is thin, um, you, you, you can get really hot down there perhaps, but you can't generate enough magma uh, down here. But then when it gets to like 50 kilometers thickness, so 25 and 50, all of a sudden you can generate a lot of magma. If it gets too thick, you don't generate enough. So that's just showing you the sweet spot happens to be here. Um, so to get the felsic magmas, you want to be uh, thick crust. Now I've done the same where I put the, uh, a dry system and you can see with the dry system, I, I just can't generate a lot of magmas, okay? And so this is telling you, of course, water is essential for making uh, large volumes of granite. Um, but water alone is not, if you go here, right? What you actually need is thick crust uh, in the combination of water to generate large volumes of cold magmas, andesites or granites or dacites and rhyolites, whatever, whatever felsic magma you like, it needs to be thick and you need water. So back to this, I, I hope with that kind of shows you even in the modern sense, Crustal thickening is key, water is secondary, and it helps. But in the, our vision uh, uh, framework for today is uh, the water comes in through subduction, and that's why we have granites. Um, so what are the implications of this thick uh, active crust? And, and this goes back to uh, Sierra Nevada, or we, at least we have insights coming from the Sierra Nevada. And uh, this is a, 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 like a stratigraphic section of the Sierra Nevada. And if you go below the plutons and keep going down, what you find are these mafic cumulates, uh, garnet peroxinites. They look like equigites, but they're really not. So we, uh, we call them arclogites. Mihai Duchia, Don Anderson, uh, uh, Jason Sully call them arclogites. And I sort of like that term uh, just to distinguish them from your uh, Franciscan type equigites. And here's an AFM diagram that shows uh, all the plutons going here, and they're going down this iron depletion trend to become more silica or alkali rich. And then the garnet or the arclogites are here. And they actually show this antithetical or complementary um, uh, cumulate line of uh, crystalline of descent 
uh, to the liquids itself. So they're complementary. So what? Um, so these down there, what do they tell us? And they form when you have thick crust. What do they do? What is the significance of these, if any, other than from a petrologist view, they're, they're uh, pretty cool to, to look at. Do they have broader significance? And um, uh, a few years ago, Ming Tang, who had worked uh, also with Roberta Rudnick, uh, came to Rice and as a postdoc and worked, uh, brought his expertise on European systematics. And uh, he, we came up with uh, this idea, well, well, let's just look at the European systematics he's gone at proxenites. The reason why he was interested in that is that all these rare earth elements um, pretty much have the same valence state, plus three, with the exception of cerium and europium. Uh, cerium is not that important uh, in the magmatic conditions, their variance and very, uh, uh, valence state, but europium is. It, it can be plus two or plus three. And whether uh, it's mixed valence state, it tells you the electron activity or this thing, this oxygen partial pressure. We call it oxygen fugacity here. And that's important because oxygen fugacity of the magmas, by the time they reach the surface, dictates the um, valence state or the, uh, the speciation of all the volatiles, carbon, hydrogen, uh, uh, sulfur, and nitrogen, which have major implications for uh, interacting with the surface from the atmosphere. Are they reduced volcanic gases or oxidized volcanic gases? Do they consume oxygen or not? That's kind of why we were interested in this, although we didn't get to that point with this particular work um, that, that he did. Um, because he, so he looked at this, and this is the data, whole rock MG number. You don't need to know uh, what this is so much other than the most primitive guys are here. And then as the magmas evolve, they drop out cumulus that move it this way to the, to the left. And the most important thing he saw, and this is this europium anomaly one, any deviation from that tells you you have mixed valence state. It's not just plus three. And if it's mixed, we have a handle on oxygen fugacity. And so they're all down here, which was very surprising uh, to us. Um, we first thought something had gone wrong, but uh, if you, you can convert these European anomalies into an effective oxygen fugacity in the source. And, and uh, you can see here, um, uh, his data intercept here, and this is telling you that the mantle wedge is not particularly oxidized. I know there's debate over whether it's oxidized or not, but within error, we're all saying the same thing. All we're saying is it's not you know, plus one or plus two. It's here around zero, negative one. Maybe it could be a little higher, um, but uh, it doesn't start off super oxidized. Um, but later on, what happens is, how do you explain this European systemx that rise uh, up? And because it's mixed valence, what actually happens is most of the crystallizing phases don't like European two plus. And so the magma gets more and more enriched in European three plus, and so it changes. And if we can combine that with some model of differentiation, we can convert this European systematics there, even to oxygen fugacity as the magma evolves, as it's leaving its depths down there and going up. And you can calculate these um, effective uh, European uh, partition coefficients, uh, empirical ones from, from our data, convert that to FO2. And it shows you that when you start, nothing unusual about these magmas, but eventually, they become much more oxidized. And so you get up to residual melt fraction of 0.4, 0.3, uh, which is where you get uh, these really felsic rocks. You're at FMQ plus two or three, which is high oxygen, no longer reduced. It cannot be a sink for volcanic, uh, for oxygen in the atmosphere, if, if this is what you were interested in. Um, and so what's causing that enrichment or, or that oxidation is, is what we didn't know uh, from that data alone, but there were hints. Again, the gadolinium euterbium ratio, which is a hint of garnet, correlates with elevation of crustal thickness in the work of Farner and Lee. So it was already in our face. We just weren't uh, brave enough to say it at that time. But then Ming Tang uh, looked at it more carefully and showed, well, of course, garnet, uh, in retrospect, it's obvious, well, garnet gets stabilized at, at thicker uh, crust. And he was, brave enough to suggest that maybe garnet is responsible for all of this, something that I hadn't really thought about myself, and was that it turns out these magmatic garnets, they have very high iron contents, but they don't like ferric iron. Now, ferric iron can go into garnet, uh, like the um, androdite component, but it, 
it's uh, for these magmatic garnets, you don't have a lot of ferric iron uh, based on the limited uh, data that we actually had at the time. And since then, uh, Ming Tang has confirmed that that is indeed the case, very low ferric iron contents. But he went on a, out on a limb and just went ahead to model that garnet fractionation. What would it do in terms of the oxygen fugacity? And this is what uh, he ends up getting. It rises up at the same time when you can remove iron from the system, total iron. Uh, something that uh, we always had trouble explaining with other hypotheses like magnetite fractionation couldn't explain uh, the rise in FO2, but it could explain the depletion of iron. So garnet really is the only one and that was um, laid out clearly in this in Tang and, and a series of other papers that he's, he's done. So I, I'm not going to expand more on that. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time in the past talking about that interface between the deep crust and the surface environment and atmospheric oxygen, but uh, that's for a different talk. But I do want to just quickly summarize in, in, in a, a, a paper here where we were speculative uh, was to suggest that the composition of the crust uh, matters and uh, in terms of uh, oxygen cycling in the, in the surface environment. And one of the old, older uh, uh, ideas was that the oxygen fugacity of the mantle changes with time. And that may still be right, uh, but we offer Another thing to think about is that, you know, maybe you don't need it to change, but the composition of the crust um, and its ability and, and the gases that come out of it, that, that its ability to react with oxygen changes. And so if you were to thicken the crust, then suddenly, uh, or the, the style of making continental crust is one that is very thick and forms garnet, then um, the sink, uh, the, this terrestrial sink, uh, disappears or is weakened. And so oxygen levels can build up. And that might maybe explain the first GOE. The second GOE, I don't know, although we have some ideas in this paper. Um, but I'm gonna move on from there and that maybe just helps those of you who are more uh, into the surface environment uh, understand that, that the possible connections to of the deep earth to the surface, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I come back to this, uh, maybe a little break now and, and look at our present planet. Um, and this one, I think we understand, and it's a plate tectonic world. There's mid-ocean ridges, and the continents move around because the plates are, are spreading and you have subduction. The mountains are formed where you have collision and subduction zones. And I think we understand this today. But one place where I haven't thought so much about, except from you know the, the deeper mantle, the lithospheric mantle, but is in the Archean, what, what about a world without plate tectonics? Um, uh, you can envision, uh, here's plate tectonic mode. This is from uh, Craig O'Neill and uh, different cases for basically different internal heating. And you would think that if you went back in time in the Archean, convection would be more vigorous, it's hotter, but it's not as, that simple because if you say you have a lot of heat production, the temperature contrast across the core and the mantle is much lower. And so you can't get these upwellings. Um, Similarly, or uh, uh, another reason is it, uh, if you have a hot mantle, um, and uh, this was pioneered by Jun Kornaga, that um, you, you have um, melts, uh, you uh, pretty much uh, extract all the water, and the lithospheric mantle is dry and it gets really strong. And if you can't bend the plate, no matter how high the Rayleigh number is, uh, you can't. Um, uh, subduct, um, so you get a stagnant lid. And then Lenardic uh, argued that if it's too hot, uh, the viscosity of the mantle or the steam sphere is too low, so the viscous stresses needed to bend the plate are too low. So a lot of things are counterintuitive. When it's hotter, you might not be able to get plate tectonics. You get a stuck lid or a stagnant lid regime. And then the question is, can you form continental crust in that uh, scenario? And of course, I know much less about this period. And, and so what I'm going to say here, please take it with a big grain of salt and look at it as me trying to uh, explore and uh, kind of question myself here. But if you go to Australia, and there's um, uh, some work by Sandiford and Ben Cranendong, but I'm sure there were much earlier works on this. Um, so uh, not doing justice in giving everyone credit here. But here's the scale 50 kilometers. And I've always been fascinated by the Pilbara here, where these blobs here. They call them these dome and keel structures, and they're TTGs, tonalite, trondromite, granites. Um, although they look different from our you know, Sierra Nevada type 
uh, plutons and that the plutons in the Sierra Nevada, these modern day stuff, are, are very homogeneous. And these, you know, look a little bit more like migmatites with melts squirting around. Um, but they're also much bigger. Look at the scale here, one big body. And they're also separated by these septa of greenstone belts. And there's a, a, a difference in kind of metamorphic grade here, igneous to metamorphic, basically. So they're, they're big giant things here. And, um, and so they don't look like how magmas are coming up in arcs today. Uh, and this is their zoomed in version. So there's like this onion rind around it made of uh, these metamorphic rocks that are older. And these clearly have intruded uh, into that and pushed the stuff away around it. And what Sandiford uh, did was um, think about a scenario like this where the early karst formation, you, you, you're piling up uh, a thick layers of basalt. How you pile them up, I don't know, but you just get these thick piles. And then you get this thing they call conductive incubation. And uh, earlier on in Earth's history, heat production was a lot higher, of course, because the half-life of uranium-235 is quite short. And so and you get the thick crust here, radioactive heating, maybe it ends up heating up the lower parts of the crust to the point where maybe you get some melting and the melting makes it more uh, lower density. And then uh, the lower crust actually upwells up to the surface, but not like what we have today, where we have magmas from the mantle shoot in and it's a primary sort of process. This is after the fact, after the, the crust has been formed, it has this resurgence as it heats up in the, and, and you get these like salt diapers basically, but at a much larger scale and uh, emanating from much greater uh, depths. And the only way to do this, by the way, to get these big ones, the length scale of these dome and keel things uh, uh, has to scale with the thickness of this unstable or buoyant layer. And so the thickness layer actually matters uh, a lot. And so I come to this importance of radioactive decay, crustal thickness. Uh, we know that um, today the uh, upper crust is uh, felsic and has more potassium and Uranium, thorium, and potassium all kind of go together. So uh, uh, you would think that um, the crust today is radiogenic. Yeah, but basaltic crusts shouldn't be too radiogenic right here, down over there, low potassium, uranium, and thorium. So how do you heat up uh, basaltic crust? Um, now, of course, in the early Archean, much more heat production, so that, that helps. But the other one is, and these are more conceptual slides first, that that uh, if you thicken the crust, this is basaltic crust, and the size of this guy, yellow thing, is the concentration of heat production A. If you thicken it, like triple it, then you triple the amounts of heat production. And so that the surface heat flow will reflect that. It gets tripled, or at least uh, uh, if you uh, plus the, the basal uh, heat flow. So even though the concentrations may not be high, just the very fact of thickening well, it ends up heating up the crust. How much do you have to thicken is, is of course the question. And so stuff we're still playing around with, um, here is showing you undifferentiated, just look at the blue line, uh, uh, basaltic crust three billion years plotted versus essentially the thickness of the crust. And this tells you the temperature at the base of the crust and uh, just focus on the top one. These are just for different basal heat flows. You can see that uh, we're just going to ask whether you cross the solidus with thickening, and this is just with basalt. Um, you, and so at 40 kilometers, you could cross the wet basalt solidus, in which case you can start to generate granitic rocks. If it were dry, you'd have to get much thicker to 60 kilometers. And I don't know how thick the crusts were back at that time, but yes, you can get these granitic rocks. You don't actually necessarily need plate tectonics. You just need, to, again, to have thick crust. And the question is, how do you make that thick crust? And whether you have water or not in a non-plate tectonic world, uh, of course, would be important. And there are two ways in the non-plate tectonic world that I can see of making uh, uh, two uh, simplistic views of making crust. One is by underplating, and the, uh, one is the oldest, two, three, four, five, so in the sequence of uh, basalts that you add up there. But, uh, and you can have an ocean, but you really never interact with the ocean because you're underplating, you're adding stuff to the bottom. In that case, it'd be dry melting. You probably won't get a lot of granites, but you can have thick crust and maybe continents, just no granites. On the other hand, you can have overplating where you, the earth surface is made up by flows. 
and they bury each other until they get deeper and deeper. And, and then here they, they melt. In this place, you would get granites and continents and granites go together. Here you have continents, but no granites, or at least thick crust, no granites. So uh, the idea is that these thick partially molten zones, they eventually give rise to these large diapirs um, in, the, in the Archean. And a number of people, uh, uh, Jean Bedard has talked about this and, and uh, Condi and, and many others. So um, I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, talking um, things that are, uh, I have less expertise in, of course. Um, so let's look at the temperature of the base of the crust through time. Would that same process operate to the present? And this is where the radioactive heating decay through Earth's history matters. And here you can see for the, uh, the, the dry conditions, the solid lines, 60 kilometers, you can, it can be hot, so 4 billion years ago. Uh, 45 kilometers and 60 kilometers, you can easily get melting. But as you go to 2 billion years in the present, unless you can build thick crust, uh, really thick crust, in general, you can't have these big partially molten zones in the mantle unless you have recharge. And that would be then the case of the modern day arc. But the continental crust or these crusts like Anton Java, they won't sit around and they're not going to melt. But in the Archean, let them sit a little bit, they'll incubate and they'll, they're going to melt. Uh, and you don't need to have plate tectonics to do that. Um, and this is just showing you the same thing, just the, the thickness of the melt layers. Uh, will decrease with time. To, uh, you know, 45 kilometers a good one as a reference. Basically, it dies out by 2 billion years ago. So just on that, the nature of our planet of crust formation probably should change with time. And so I, I won't answer all those questions because I don't know the answers, but maybe leave with you know, the more the questions I have. And recent paper by Ming Tang, uh, uh, from Beijing uh, University when he got back there is how, uh, that I would ask is how does active crustal thickness change with time? And, and uh, he's got a new proxy that um, if it works, it, it's uh, pretty phenomenal what it's uh, telling us. Uh, this is from European and that is telling you here, crustal thickness, active crustal thickness, meaning the crustal thickness when it's being formed is changing. What are the implications for all of this in terms of uh, making granites uh, and, and, and actually controlling the redox states of the magnets that make it to the surface. And then superimposed on this, the questions of, uh, is the crust dry or damp or wet? Uh, what are the mechanisms for making uh, the crust? And so I don't know. Um, we can think about a scenario where it's just like today, plate tectonics, or it could be a stagnant lid with large plumes like this. And then you have to ask, is it overplating or underplating or somewhere in between? Or is it something like this, where you have stagnant lid uh, with sag, sag duction, and so you have something like um, plate tectonics, but it's more maybe like Venus, where more circular features, and you don't have focus downwinds go all the way to the bottom of the mantle, they just get stuck up here. I, I sort of like this one because of my bias from studying the cratonic mantle, but that's for a different uh, story. So I'm gonna end with, we thicken the crust, generate all of this, uh, heat production and you're, you're melting, you get these diapirs to form uh, some melt segregation going on. Uh, and then um, you, as a consequence, because these heat producing elements like the melts, they go up. And so you differentiate the crust. And so the upper crust, of course, becomes more radiogenic and the lower parts get less radiogenic. And then the interesting thing is in that, the total heat flow at steady state uh, is the same. It doesn't depend on how you distribute the heat. But the thermal state in below does depend on how you distribute the heat because I could say, well, what if I got to this extreme place and then I eroded this upper radiogenic layer? Then of course the crust will cool off. And when it cools off, it gets stronger and maybe that's related to stabilizing the continent. Um, so here is just, we're gonna walk through this. This is temperature versus depth. This is the geotherm and this is a wet basalt solidus. And we start off with a thin oceanic uh, crust and this is the surface heat flow. And then this is the thickness of my radiogenic layer. And I'm assuming here when I differentiate, I move 100% efficiency, all the radiogenics to the melt, which is obviously not uh, correct, but that's just for simplicity. So the first step you do is you thicken, triple it. And when you thicken, it heats up. 
So we heated up uh, the crust, and so now you can start to melt. And then you start to move the radiogenics around, and you'll find that the surface heat flow doesn't change, but actually you start to cool at depth because you move the heat producing stuff to the surface. And if you keep constant to the surface, you keep on cooling. And then finally you get rid of that, you get your final cooling that go, goes on. Um, so uh, after differentiation, what we predict is uh, that you, you well, first you, you get really hot in the bottom, and then you move the heat producing elements up to the surface, and then you cool this stuff off and the base of the crust or the crust gets kind of rigid, more rigid. And, uh, uh, and maybe that is related to stabilizing the continent. And um, of interest to me is where these heat producing elements go after you erode them, they go into the ocean basins and will generate a thermal blanket. This is a thin thermal blanket because it's diluted over the broader areas of the ocean basin. So maybe it doesn't have an impact on the thermal state of the ocean basins. But then the fate of this stuff is, of course, uh, of, of interest. But this whole process of thickening followed by erosion, I suspect may be important for uh, stabilizing the, the continent, or at least one aspect of it. Um, so that's it. I leave it at that. And uh, with this reorganized framework, I don't know if it's right, but uh, uh, crustal thickness, I think, is really the, the key to making continental crust. And granite is the byproduct, not a requirement. And uh, you need to reach critical thickness. And if you throw a little water, you can get a lot of granite. And so maybe this will allow us to think about the other planets in a different way. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senti. That's really good. Um, we'll go ahead and we're going to start a, a question session, sort of Q&A. Um, people who have uh, who have questions. That, the only thing we ask is that if you have a really you have questions that you think are really specific uh, that wouldn't be applicable to the broad audience, uh, try to hold that to either just the discussion or talk with Senti separately. Um, but yes, so we'll wait to see if anybody raises their hand or puts anything in the chat. Okay. Itai has a question. Thanks for that talk, Cindy. It's really cool stuff. Um, so one of the things that I was curious about um, is whether there's a, a throttling effect on uh, the product of F and H that uh, should lead to some sort of steady state thickness of, uh, of continents, right? You showed that you need thickening in order to get substantial melting, but then that um, as the, the crust gets thicker, um, that actually slows down the, um, uh, or um, decreases the, uh, the, the melting. Um, so is there some sort of a, a steady state continental thickness uh, at which, um, you know, the, the, the melting essentially slows down enough that uh, the, the content stabilizes at a certain thickness? Um, I, I don't know about the steady state uh, thickness. Uh, I mean, if it gets too thick, it, it will shut down. Um, but what controls the, so in that study, we actually don't talk about what controls the, the thickness um, because that uh, is sort of, separate but related is, is the control of magmatic flux, uh, tectonic compression, and erosion as well. And, and uh, when all those act together, yeah, you can get a steady state thickness. And then my interest with the paper was for those particular characteristic thicknesses, um, how much milk can you get out? Uh, so island arcs, for example, steady state thickness is probably 20 kilometers. And that's because the upper plate is extending. Continental arcs, uh, it can vary. In the Cascades, it's probably 30 to 40 kilometers. In Andes, it could be 60 or even greater. And that's just telling us something about the interplay between the compression and the magmatic fluxing. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can ask while we're waiting. Uh, so, uh, so I'm just wondering, or oh, uh, we have TTGs that go back, well, at least to 3.3 or even to 3.8 billion years back in time. And I'm wondering, based on it, um, can you say that 
uh, crust was already thick by 3.8. And if it was thick already, uh, would you generate garnet? And would you similarly fractionate to make uh, filthic magmas to be more oxidized uh, at a very, very early stage? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. That, that's a great question. That's the kind of question that I want to know. Uh, and I, I think it's possible. I, I don't know if, you know, I, I laid out these simple models uh, and I'll be the first to admit, I, I wouldn't use models, my models or anyone's models to, to um, uh, uh, constrain uh, whether we got, uh, you know, if we have TTGs, whether the crust was really thick, because there are a lot of uncertainties in those models. Uh, I would only use those models to sort of kind of guide uh, our intuition for it. And I think at the end of the day, you have to go back to the petrology and, and look at things like gadolinium euterbium or the European uh, signatures that um, Ming Tang has looked at or, or others and, and try to bring that, those together um, and barometry, all of that. So that's, that's where, so what I'm offering is really just intuition, but the actual numbers have to come from the data there. So I don't know the answer. I know I see Kent here on there. I see Jean Bedard. They they probably know way more. And I see Michael Brown too, and Roberta too. Uh, they probably know way more than me on on this. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a couple of questions in the chat now. Uh, John Incarnation says, "Fascinating talk." How or, or could you comment on the fact that many origins are built on older origins, Appalachian on Grenville, for example? I think this supports your proposal that already thick crust promotes formation of large amounts of granitic, granitic magma. Yeah, uh, origins built on origins. I, I guess I don't have too much to comment on that other than, I mean, uh, that, uh, that appears to be true. Uh, not only that, uh, I've always thought the origins become basins and, the, and then the basins become origins, or, the, or meaning that the rifting happens on the origins. You can look at um, rifting uh, from on the Appalachians or the Mozambique belt, uh, uh, all of those and in Western North or uh, mid continent, we have these allocogens. So uh, that were once high and then they become basins, they come back high with the one in Oklahoma, the Washita's, right? Um, so I, I don't know, but I, I suspect there's actually um, uh, weaknesses, pre existing weak. Well, once you form a weakness, it just stays there forever. Uh, what those weaknesses are, I don't know. Um, uh, my, my bias is uh, some projects that we're currently working on um, is that it may be related to something in the lithospheric mantle that promotes um, melting, and so which then weakens it. But uh, why I don't know, despite some of my biases there. All right, the next question in the chat says thanks for your from L LC. Thank you from your for your interesting talk. Does the thickness of subcontinental lithospheric mantle matter? Uh, yeah, that that's a really interesting question. Um, I guess it depends on what, uh, when in this process we're talking. I think in the case of like the Sierra Nevada and the arcs it doesn't matter because it's very thin. Uh, but in the case of uh, a mature continent, uh, it matters. And, and the big question is, uh, you know, you can talk about all the stuff in the crust forming, but then you have, especially these old ones in the Archean, it's really thick cratonic root that's compositionally distinct. And um, uh, how do you form those? How do you uh, keep them there? Uh, yeah. Uh, they're big questions and there are a lot of contradicting uh, ideas when you try to match the crust with the mantle. Uh, so uh, that one of the 
the big paradoxes to me um, that uh, if I had some more time, I'd want to spend on it is we always talk about cratonic mantle being so strong. And that's what stabilizes the continents, or at least some people do, including me. I've said that. But, but then we have evidence that cratonic mantle is formed by thickening events as well, just like the crust. That comes from all sorts of independent lines of evidence, from geophysics to geochemistry. But to thicken, it had to be weak. So how do you uh, uh, have these things weak, and then they heal quickly enough to make a strong cratonic mantle? To me, that's the million dollar question if you want to go deeper into the mantle. And how does that connect to the, the crust? And I sort of hinted at that, that this removal of radiogenics might cool the crust, but it also cools the, the, the mantle underneath. And cooling is one step in, in st strengthening the, the continents. Standard view is water, that it's water or the lack of water. Uh, but I, and that's what I have adhered to as well, but I, I'm not sure anymore. Like I said, as I call it older, I'm not sure of anything anymore. So, so really just trying to ask questions uh, that I used okay. to take for granted. Okay, can Cynthia, I had to switch to my iPad. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, the next question is from Lyle Nelson. Thank you. Does the, does the radiogenic heat blanket from weathering into ocean basins potentially cause an issue for subduction initiation slash modern plate tectonic onset, or is it not thick enough to matter? If it does matter, how does subduction initiation out overcome this? Yeah, uh, neat question. I, I, I don't know because I didn't actually um, even think about calculating that. That was an afterthought I put in, but, but uh, I doubt it would matter as much uh, because uh, if it gets distributed, uh, diluted in the ocean basins, the layer is too thin to, uh, to matter. And, uh, and also it's so concentrated, even, yeah, it's concentrated at the surface. Um, so it doesn't have a huge impact on the subsurface thermal state, um, unless it gets really thick. And that may, there could be local effects, but I haven't uh, actually calculated that myself. My guess is probably not. Okay. Next one is from Greg Vitalik. Great, uh, great talk. Bowen's reaction series is actually the reverse of the diagram you showed, which was Goldrich's weather. Oh, is that... Goldrich's weathering sequence of minerals and soils. Oh. Weathering does produces a special sauce, making the world more felsic. How does that figure into your model? Uh, okay. Well, first, gosh, I I didn't even notice that. It looked, it's kind of remarkable how similar they look. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. So much for Wikipedia. Uh, so much for my classes there. Um, the weathering, um, I guess you're uh, probably asking that, you know, weathering uh, uh, attacks the mafic minerals preferentially. And so leaving behind, of course, more felsic stuff, quartz sands, for example. And would that be the process that makes uh, continents more felsic? Um, uh, sure, it contributes, and um, I, I myself have written papers provocatively suggesting that it's very important. Um, uh, but I don't know actually how important it is, uh, and it's not so easy to separate out the different uh, effects. Certainly, weathering has a role because the oxygen isotopes of a lot of felsic rocks are not uh, mantle-like, but how much, uh, I don't know. Um, but despite what I said in the past, I, I do th about weathering being very important, and it, and it is, I, I still think the dominant control is magnetism. All right, our next one is from Jean Bedard. Your volume of melt generation assumes an andesitic to, bat to basaltic protolith if there was already a large percent felsic melt in the crust, then much larger amounts of second stage felsic melts could be generated, no? Uh, yeah, for, for sure, yes. Those, those FH curves depend on uh, uh, the bulk composition. And I took something more uh, mafic. Um, yeah, 
so you know, if it was more andesitic, uh, uh, you could get even more. And you have to ask then, how do you get those andesitic stuff to begin with, uh, or more felsic stuff to begin with? Um, that would you know, kick the can down the road. But that could be, you know, there's other views where you, hydrous melting of the mantle or flux melting of the mantle generates andesites directly from the mantle. Uh, and I haven't considered that. I'm not sure if that's where you were going, but uh, um, yeah. Is it okay if I ask the question directly? Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, John. Um, uh, the, the only point I wanted to make is uh, the, I'd say the large majority of our key and TTGs have inherited zircons in them and are the are multi-cyclic things. They're remelts of remelts of remelts. Uh, yeah. It, um, uh, so the model I have, you, you could account for that. Uh, you just change the, you just make it a little bit more complex and change the starting composition. Uh, yeah, and it would get easier. Yeah. Uh, but I, I really like your model. I, you yeah. know, I think it, ex it potentially explains a lot, but. Uh, well, a lot of it is actually inspired by your stuff, so. <laughs> uh, the Mutual Admiration Society. All right, I've got one more in the chat here from K. Senders Sarwan. Sir, is there any particular reason for the considerable higher uh, silica concentrations in plutons along the coast than the inland as provided in your slides? Oh, uh, uh, interesting, yeah, very interesting question. Yeah, um, I'm surprised uh, you noticed that so, so quickly in the, the map. Um, yeah, so we we see that uh, uh, so the the western part is um, in the plutons is uh, was thinner at least we think it was thinner based on various geochemical signatures the crust and then the eastern part was thicker and and, and that's why you get the, the more uh, and andesites the large volume andesites but you're exactly right that the most silicic ones uh, occur when the crust is thin alongside um, the mafic ones. And that's this uh, very commonly seen in extensional areas, this bimodal, what do they call it? The, the daily gap. And, uh, but they're small amount, they're small uh, volumes. And I don't know, uh, I don't think, um, and there's many ideas out there. My, my, at least in what I, in that paper, I've always thought what happens is in these thin crusts, uh, you don't have a lot of time to, uh, for those magmas to incubate. So pretty much when the basalt gets in, it stays as a basalt. And, um, but then uh, any late stage melts that form are going to be really cold. Uh, and most of them don't even get them. But when you do get them, they're just going to be uh, rhyolites. And uh, so the gap is there because you, you just chilled everything out and uh, the only other melts you might have are these late guys, and they're relatively insignificant. So like um, Iceland has rhyolites too, but not a lot of them. Okay. At the moment, there's nothing else in the chat. So anybody who wants to stick around and have more specific chat with Cinti, we want to, Cinti, we want to be respectful to your schedule. If you need to go, just let us know. But no, we I'm also good. like to let things go as long as they want. I'm good. Um, Thank you uh, uh, so much for the questions and inviting me. Uh, very, very interesting questions too. Uh, Sintili, you mentioned Onten Chava at the beginning and uh, some people like Boltz Cumber suggested with by sort of girl 